Disney Springs has to be one of the coolest and most impressive shopping centers in the entire world. Hundreds of unique shops and restaurants, but did you know it used to be even cooler? Here, yes, right here, this very island used to be home to the nightlife capital of Central Florida. This is the history of Pleasure Island, then versus now. Disney Springs has been a part of Walt Disney World property since its inception, but it hasn't always been the way it is today. Opening just four years after Magic Kingdom, on March 22nd, 1975, Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village was home to, you guessed it, shops. Most of which were generic stores you'd find at any seaside village, and the theming reflected the same. I guess the closest thing Disney Springs has today, architecture-wise, is this pin trading shop. Kinda boring, right? Enter everyone's favorite theme park bad boy, Michael Eisner. <laughs> when Michael Eisner and Frank Wells took over the reins of the Walt Disney Company in 1984, one of the many Disney Parks projects they had on their list of things to fix was the outdated mess that was Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village. At the same time, other Orlando attractions were popping up all over the place. One in particular was drawing too much of the adult crowd for Michael Eisner's liking. Church Street Station was a nightclub and entertainment district based on a jazz-oriented Dixieland feel that drew massive crowds from 1972 to the 90s. Of course, Michael Eisner thought, why would we let them get our business when we could just do the same exact thing? Which then birthed the idea of Pleasure Island. What exactly was Pleasure Island, you ask? Well, this massive piece of underdeveloped land just south of the shopping village adjacent to the Empress Lily, now known as Paddlefish, would soon become the new nightlife capital of Orlando. This overhaul would include not just Pleasure Island, but massive changes across the newly renamed shopping village known as Downtown Disney. Now there's a specific reason we're standing in this exact spot. It actually used to be the main entrance to Pleasure Island. Just over the bridge was the big, iconic Pleasure Island sign. Obviously, it was on top of this building as well, but this exact spot was where you could buy a ticket to Pleasure Island. This ticket booth was a location where you could pick up your wristband, which was basically your ticket to get into any of the nightclubs here on Pleasure Island. And I think it's very important to mention by the end of Pleasure Island's lifespan, these wristbands were not required. You would simply go to the front of each club and pay to get in there. Funny enough, just about a year ago, our friends Poppy and Nick sent us some mail, including a bunch of 90s park maps, including this handy dandy downtown Disney <laughs> park map from the late 90s. We're gonna be walking through the old Pleasure Island and showing you exactly which buildings were which and what was going on there and I don't know. I don't, this is a new style vlog. Do you guys like this so far? It's, it's definitely new for me, but um, I think this is gonna be fun. <laughs> Crossing over the main entrance bridge into the former Pleasure Island, our first stop is Morimoto Asia. Now this building actually has only undergone one change since being built. It's hard to tell since the documentation online is scarce. I'm sure you'll notice a trend in this video. A lot of these buildings have undergone multiple venue changes. Of course, this is the former spot of Mannequins, probably the most popular nightclub on all of Pleasure Island during its heyday. Opening May 1st, 1989, this three-level nightclub was the focal point of nightlife at Disney for nearly its entire run. Mannequins was a contemporary dance club featuring a state-of-the-art light and sound system. And probably the most impressive part, the rotating dance floor. Yes, you, you heard me right. The dance floor spun, slowly that is, while the guests got their groove on. Even though it was a slow turn, I'm sure it may have been an issue for some of the intoxicated guests. <laughs> A big moment in the night was always the Phantom of the Opera show slash moment, I, I don't know what to call it, where a cast member dressed as the Phantom of the Opera would wander the stage with a bright flashlight, searching the crowd for his next victim. All while a techno trance rendition of the classic Phantom of the Opera theme would play in the background during this moment. As much as I'd love to see this one in person, unfortunately it no longer fit with the future plans for Downtown Disney, soon to be Disney Springs, and was closed permanently on September 27th, 2008 to make way for future plans. Oddly enough, one of the only Pleasure Island locations to survive the great purging of 2008 was right across the walkway. And that is Raglan Road. 
Opening October 21st, 2005, Downtown Disney brought guests a true slice of Ireland in this honestly really fun Irish pub slash restaurant. I ate here on actual St. Patrick's Day this year, and although it was very hectic, it was a blast. Before Raglan Road, there was Pleasure Island Jazz Company, a place seemingly built to rival its rival, the aforementioned Church Street Station, conveniently placed right at the entrance of Pleasure Island. This brought promise that not only Pleasure Island was a place for modern music lovers, but adults of all ages and music preferences. There'll be more of that soon, but I really wanted to continue this walkthrough in like a cohesive order, so onward. Which brings us over to Paddlefish. This is technically considered just outside the Old Pleasure Island area, but the modern day Paddlefish was under two different names and owners previously. The Empress Lily, which opened way back in 1977, soon after the Lake Buena Vista shopping village opened, then in 1995 was closed to make way for Fulton's Crab House. This was during a period in downtown Disney history where restaurants and some venues were being outsourced to third party companies. You know, today it's actually pretty hard to imagine the Disney Springs skyline without this permanently docked seafood joint. I'm sure it'll continue to jump hands of third-party companies for generations to come. Just next door, Terralina Crafted Italian was previously home to Portobello Yacht Club, another Italian place, which also went under the name Panetta's, but only in the 90s ABC Family sitcom Step by Step. During their obligatory Disney World episode, just like every other ABC sitcom at that time, the characters John and Rich, played by Brandon Call and Jason Marsden, in story are spending their money like there's no tomorrow. After John lies to the two ladies in the park saying that he was a member of the Walt Disney family, which conveniently lands them a date at the quote, most expensive restaurant on Disney property. Now, because this episode took place on Disney property, they needed a restaurant that was on Disney property where they could film the exterior shots, and they used the Portobello Yacht Club. But for the negative press that obviously came along with this storyline, the restaurant and TV producers decided to rename the restaurant Panetta's. That's literally the only fact I have about this one, so um, if we could move on, that'd be great. We have so much to cover, guys. <laughs> ah, Boathouse, the greatest restaurant on Disney property. And if you disagree with me, please let me know your home address in the comments below so I could come personally deliver you the filet mignon sliders and you will abruptly change your mind. This building before Boathouse actually wasn't here. There was a lot of restructuring in this area during the switch from Pleasure Island slash Downtown Disney to Disney Springs today. And this corner of the island was one of them. A lot of maps even just show it as like a dead end with a flagpole, um, this flagpole to be exact. But on the other side of this flagpole where the bakery and hipster hat shop are now stood the fireworks factory. The fireworks factory was operated by Levy Restaurants, the same company that ran Portobello Yacht Club and Fulton's Crab House across the way. But this place actually had super cool theming. <laughs> Pleasure Island legend states that Meriwether Pleasure, the founder of the island, manufactured fireworks in this building until his cigar created an explosion, the effects of which were very clear once stepping inside the building. The food itself was said to be explosive, which would have probably made for the perfect content for that one like Disney creator who like at the parks gets like diarrhea and stuff. I don't know, I mean, too bad it's not open still. And I've been told that he's retired from that series, so um, stop asking. The fireworks factory closed in 1999 to make way for the Wild Horse Saloon later that year, and then in 2001, Motion, another modern dance club. In place of where Jacques Lindsay's hangar bar is today was two different venues. Opening on May 1st, 1989 was XZFR Rockin' Roller Dome, which in the Orlando Sentinel was described as a futuristic tri-level all-ages club that featured an oldies through 80s rock format. Roller skating was $2 per half hour. I cannot find any details on rental costs or a waiver that you had to sign, but it likely didn't exist for the sole fact that it closed due to safety concerns less than one year later, which made way for the next venue, the Rock and Roll Beach Club, a live music joint where both original and cover bands would play nightly. If you search this place on YouTube, the only thing that will come up are uploads from the user Sing Sal Sing, which I'm assuming was the singer of the band Pan who often played at the Rock and Roll Beach Club back in the day. Also, not many people talk about this, 
But the very first live performance from the group in sync was performed in 1995 from Pleasure Island. I believe based off these videos, it was at Rock and Roll Beach Club. This is not confirmed because no one seems to know for sure online. But because of the three levels of this venue and the similar lighting setup, I can only assume. Out of all of the changes to this area of Disney Springs, I'm probably most happy with the addition of Jacques Lindsay's hangar bar. It actually holds true to the original concept of Pleasure Island, more than many of the nightclubs and restaurants featured in this video. I mean, maybe we'll have to go back soon. I heard they have a killer holiday menu. We'll see. And of course, that brings us to the Edison. And oddly enough, we actually have reservations for the Edison. We're headed inside right now. It's actually one of our favorite spots here at Disney Springs. We're gonna show you what the inside looks like before, after, and also we're gonna eat some, eat some grub. Let's go inside. Before the steel girders, steampunk theming, and gears galore, the building that hosted the Edison went under a different name and concept completely. That's right, folks, we have reached the Adventurers Club. The Adventurers Club was styled after a private club for world travelers and explorers set in 1937. The walls of the club were covered in artifacts and photographs from various explorations. And a super cool statue in the main room, which was actually sitting on top of a piece of furniture, which we discovered recently in the Skipper Canteen over at Magic Kingdom. Shout out if you happen to watch that recent vlog. I really appreciate all the pity viewers making it over to this one. This interactive theater experience featured animatronics, puppets, and a cast of adventurers who performed in scripted shows and improvisational comedy while mingling with the club's patrons. Today, you can find references of the Adventures Club all throughout Walt Disney World property. Since the closure of Adventures Club, Disney has established C. That is S-E-A, the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, which brings identity to a whole new universe of characters with a Disney adventurer lore. To avoid having this section of the video being 10 minutes long, which trust me, that would not be difficult for me to do, I would like to throw it over to Isabel and myself from the recent past to cover some current food options over at the Edison. As much as we wanted to highlight the history, we also want to highlight the food because because this is one of our favorite restaurants. So, here's our food. So the Edison is very well known for their theming. They're like steampunky theming, including even the menu items. What I got, Isabel will show you, I got the high voltage chicken sandwiches, which is a fried chicken breast bacon, sweet and spicy Korean, a word that I can't pronounce, but I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. It comes with jalapeno lime crema, which I did not get on there. It comes with on a Kaiser, Kaiser roll, lettuce, tomato, pickles, fries. That's what I got. We'll tell you how it is, but first, Isabel got the classic Edison burger. I got the Edison burger. It's a signature blend of sirloin, short rib, and brisket, topped with white cheddar, crispy onion, smoked bacon, pickles, but I got without pickles, lettuce, tomato, and special sauce. What do you think the special sauce is? I don't know. I was a little hesitant because it's a spicy burger, but because it was like a Korean sweet and spicy sauce, I knew it would be something I would most likely be able to handle. And let me tell you, this sandwich is amazing. This might be my like new order here. I normally get the Edison burger, which is what Isabel has today. It's so juicy, so like it's, it's dripping, yes. But as long as you have your plate underneath, that's all that matters. This is so, so good. I would give it eight out of 10. I would highly recommend this one. I don't know, I only had a few bites. Maybe we'll check up later, but if not, that means it's still eight out of 10. Both of our sandwiches are very like tall and very drippy. I feel like I need a shower after that, but it's really, really good. I really like this. Normally I get the um, tomato soup and grilled cheese. The tomato soup and grilled cheese is amazing, but we're going to a concert after this. And I feel like shoving my tummy full of a grilled cheese and tomato soup is not the best idea pre-concert. So um, I decided to switch it up and get the burger this time. You know, now that I think about it, there's actually one Easter egg I've never ever heard anybody talk about, and that's actually sitting right outside the main entrance of the Edison. Just outside the entrance of the Edison, you can actually find this seaplane right up here. It has a really, really fun story behind it, but just across from the Edison today sits STK, an ultra modern steakhouse offering incredible cuisine and an upbeat vibe, which is great. Yet another restaurant is great. But way back when, this was home to the Comedy Warehouse. The Comedy Warehouse Warehouse was a nightclub that featured a improv comedy troupe. It originally featured a parody show called Forbidden Disney. The club soon attracted a large return audience. 
They then switched from this scripted show to an improv comedy format after just a couple seasons to make sure that the show stayed fresh. The club unfortunately closed on September 27th of 2008. We've touched upon the lore of Pleasure Island just a little bit in this video, but I guess now would be a great time to mention these plaques. These plaques that gave backstory to the island could be found in front of nearly every venue on Pleasure Island. That being said, according to this plaque, the building that housed the comedy warehouse had previously served as the island's power station, as well as the home base for a theatrical troupe operated by Meriwether Pleasure's wife, Isabella. Okay, is it just me or is some of this lore like really, really unnecessary? <laughs> I fully understand that some of the Pleasure Island super fans will probably be a little upset with me over this, but how is like Frank, the 40 year old dad from Ohio supposed to care like about all this lore? Like what, what? Why is this here? Why is it here? <laughs> Anyways, as I mentioned, the Comedy Warehouse closed its doors alongside with most other Pleasure Island spots in 2008, which was really unfortunate because it did put a lot of Orlando-based improv actors out of work, since it was really one of the only spots to exist in Central Florida. Right next door to the Comedy Warehouse was a club called Atrax, spelled in a really, really weird way. This 70s and 80s themed dance club actually underwent a lot of changes. Moving backwards, it was a club called Cage, which, don't worry, the name implies they had cages, and trust me, they had plenty. <laughs> and before that, Videopolis East, which was the East Coast counterpart to Videopolis West, I guess. <laughs> Originally designed to help draw the teenage crowd to Disney parks in an era where the public saw Disney as a place just for kids, Videopolis was a teen nightclub that was a mirror image of most modern clubs of the time, just minus the alcohol. At the time of Pleasure Island's construction, Videopolis over at Disneyland was booming, before a few violent incidents forced it to close in 1989, and its East Coast counterpart, which had only opened in Orlando, closed as well, out of fear in the same rise in violence. Violence. Which brings us to our final stop, the modern day Maria and Enzo's. One of the two former downtown Disney slash Pleasure Island locations we are visiting here today is actually Maria and Enzo's. Are you aware of this place existing? Well, let me show you on the map. This actually used to be the BET soundstage. BET Soundstage was a dance club that featured hip hop and R&B music that opened in 1998. It replaced the Neon Armadillo, which operated here prior to that. And it probably has the funniest backstory of any of these clubs. According to Island Legend, this building was once a greenhouse for desert plants collected by Meriwether Pleasure. When the building was rediscovered, it had been taken over by a family of armadillos. As ridiculous as the backstory does sound, it did provide a much needed variety in music and feel from the four other nightclubs that were playing pretty much the same exact type of music. The BET soundstage, which replaced it, did the same thing, but obviously geared towards a different music and audience. The last couple of years, this venue operated as Soundstage Club, as the contract with Black Entertainment Television expired. The really only change externally was that the BET part of the logo was simply removed from the sign. The Soundstage Club officially closed on September 28th, 2008. Now I was shocked when I passed through these doors and entered and saw how massive this room is. And I, I should have known. I just, I've never been in here before. And this is, I'm just, I'm honored to finally actually be here. And also I want to say shout out Maria Nenzo's for having us out. We're here with a couple friends today and we're getting some sick food. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory on this building, or at least the theming of this building. In concept, I'm sure an airport-themed restaurant at Disney Springs does not sound that interesting, but let me tell you, this is an Art Deco-flared airport that is owned by these two characters, Maria and Enzo, who are a couple who traveled the world, and they're showing it through their artwork and everything else that's in this building. It feels very much like, if you've seen any movies that have highlighted like old LAX slash like higher end stuff in the 50s, 60s, that's 100% of what this feels like in here. And the food is even better. And one of my favorite parts about this restaurant is that it has that story and it maintains that like old, like Pleasure Island feel where every single building has a backstory, is within the same exact storyline. I don't know if I've covered too much of that in this video, but like it's, it's, it's carrying the torch a little bit. I know it sounds silly, but that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> 
not only is the theming and atmosphere so great here, but the food is absolutely wonderful as well. We just wrapped up our meal, which we had a huge, huge spread. Uh, by far, I think the best thing was probably this bread. This was so amazing focaccia. I, lo I love it at Panera. I know that sounds very generic, but uh, we're gonna ask some friends what their favorite thing was as well. And they're not gonna lie. Ryan is forcing me to do this review, guys. Holding me against my will as usual, but I'll give it to him. It's okay, it's okay. Um, it's really nice in here. A little cozy vibe. I said in my video, I would love to have brunch in here. It'd be cozy for a nice little brunch. I imagine eating an omelet. I don't know, just sounds cozy. But the food was really good, the meatballs, spot on. So leave it to Ryan out of all things to like the bread. The bread was fantastic, he is correct, but I would personally say the bolognese to be out of this world. See what I did there? No? Okay. But the bolognese was fantastic with homemade ricotta cheese. I think we said ricotta a thousand times in our vlogs alone, but it was very impressive. Highlight, highly recommend. Oh, and how could I forget one of the main draws to Pleasure Island in the late 80s and 90s? New Year's Eve. Just outside where Maria and Enzo's and STK sits today was the West End Stage. A focal point for entertainment, the main stage of Pleasure Island, one might say. Where each and every night would be New Year's Eve. I know, I know. Did Disney really expect guests to stay all the way up until midnight after a long day at the parks? The answer to that one is... No. Most nights, the New Year's Eve celebration actually happened around 11 p.m. rather than midnight. This seemed to actually be a huge selling point. So much so that it got the ultimate nod that any theme park is looking for, maybe? And was referenced on an October 1994 episode of The Simpsons. And just so happens to be my favorite episode of the entire show, which is Itchy and Scratchy Land, where Homer and Marge spend time at Parents Island and visit the restaurant TGI McScratchy's Good Time Food Drinkery. Welcome to TGI McScratchy's, where it's constantly New Year's Eve. Here we go again. Three, two, one. It must be wonderful to ring in the new year over and over and over. Please kill me. This episode is seriously a must watch for any Disney Parks fans because it literally spends a half hour parodying the theme parks we all know and love. I'd like to end with one tiny little remnant of Pleasure Island that actually isn't even on the island at all. For this one, we'll have to make our way to the far side of the former downtown Disney, the backside of the House of Blues. Here we are on the backside of the House of Blues where you'll find this archway made of concrete and a bunch of random stuff, including an old name tag from Pleasure Island. If you can see the top of the logo there, it used to say Janet, I believe, from Chicago, Illinois. Now it no longer does uh, because people are jerks and a lot of the other stuff has been pulled off as well, if you can't tell. There's another like 2000 little name tag something. I don't know, a lot of stuff, but here you go. It's right here on the left-hand side. This is on the back side of um, the House of Blues. There you go. And just like that, we are back exactly where we started. I hope you guys enjoyed this like then versus now of Pleasure Island. I know it's kind of like more dry compared to the other videos that I normally do on this channel, but like I really enjoyed making this and it took a while. Uh, to be honest, I had to like step away, go back, step away, go back. I started filming this at the very end of September and it is now obviously way past then. So I don't know, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please let me know in the comments down below so I know you made it to the end, what your favorite Disney Springs restaurant is. Obviously we talked about mine being Boathouse, what do you guys like? Is there anything better? Let me know in the comments. That's it for today. Thank you guys very, very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.